Okay, today will be the lecture number four. Uh, in the last lecture, we have shown that talking about the geometric formulation of special relativity. Uh, the point is that the best way to bring about the symmetry between space and time is to unite them in a four dimension uh, space time. And uh, uh, the fifth equation written in terms of the tensors in this four dimension space time will automatically respect to the principal relativity. And also, we talked about the generalized basis. Uh, the bases are different, different from the inverse bases. So therefore, for tensors, or, or factors in particular, there will be two separate expansions. One are the contravariant components. The other brings about the covariant components. So anyway, we'll continue our tensor special relativity in this lecture. In particular, we're going to talk about the four vectors, four dimension vectors: the position, down operator, and the relative the momentum and energy. Okay. So let's remember what we talked about last time: the tensors in generalized coordinates. <coughs> For the coordinates, the contravariant component transforms as the Lorentz transformation. Then the covariant components with subscripts transforms as the inverse by the inverse Lorentz transformation. And the point is that this will leave their contraction to be uh, invariant because you, uh, you know, for example, uh, the a nu you can lower it by g mu nu. Then the uh, same way you can raise the uh, the B nu by by the inverse metric, and the, in that case, the, this invariant all the indices are contracted. It's a scalar. Now we talk about a specific example of four vector, the uh, position vector, we we'll call the CT, the x naught and the xyz, the usual x1, x2, x3, with superscript because we take it to be contravariant components. And the contravariant component transformed by the Lorentz transformation, okay, it's just a, a, a compact way to write uh, this matrix equation. Uh, here it's a, a x nu, here the x prime mu, here's the Lorentz transformation. Now, this uh, space-time invariant is identified with the inner product of the uh, uh, x, 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 x prime mu, x prime mu is contracted, or it's invariant, so therefore uh, in both coordinates the same. And uh, if you write in terms of the metric, uh, in terms of, or rather the contravariant, that you the metric uh, comes in, if you write into the covariant, the inverse metric comes in. Okay. Let's concentrate on the, the metric case. And the, these are the, uh, let's say, it's just the uh, CT uh, XYZ. Then you compare what uh, this expression tells you, what this would identify with this invariant interval. And the uh, CT uh, uh, square, X square, Y square, you notice there's a minus sign, so therefore, this ma the matrix that make the scalar product must have the form minus one. Let's take care of this minus one over there and one, one, one. So this is the non-trivial metric of the Minkowski space. Have this minus sign. And uh, this is such an important metric we give us usually a special name. We call it mu nu. Turns out it's exactly the same as the inverse metric is also minus one, 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 one. So anyway, things, the most important to remember is that the metric of the Minkowski space time is a diagonal with minus one, 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 and we'll call it a mu nu. Just about all the trivial special relative result follows based on this property. You will see. Okay. So let's take about the position and the position derivatives. As said, we already said we will take the position uh, to be the contravariant vector, which means contravariant components of a vector, 
and transform according to the Lorentz transformation. Then we say the coordinate derivative transform opposite derivative. So therefore, we naturally identify the covariant. It's it's these derivatives as the covariant components of vector. So therefore, with low indices, uh, this thing we we write del sub mu, okay, and the zero components is different respect to C T, and the, the first component is different respect to X, second component to Y, and its covariant components therefore it transforms the inverse L inverse, and the uh, for the del operator. And uh, uh, as I said, the metric and its inverse metric goes like a diagonal minus 111. And uh, we can use the metric to load the index. We have the contravariant CTX, where you, you multiply it by the metric, which means you load the index, and then just pick a minus sign because it's minus sign over there. Same way, if we want to raise the index of the Dell operator, which naturally was covariant, you can make if suppose you want to have a contravariant version of the the the, the, the usual dial operator, you will end up pick a minus sign. Okay, so so you can see some sense of uh, position vector are naturally contravariant. If you write covariant form, you have this funny minus sign. Same with dial operator, naturally covariant, but if you write as contravariant component, you end have to make sure you put a minus sign there. And also, you can form the uh, invariance if the positions you form the invariance, as we talked about, it's just s squared is same as minus c squared, the proper time squared. And if you do the same thing for the del operator, which also you can contract contravariant into a covariant form, you get a minus sign here. And that's usually the del operation operator, which you're all familiar with. So now we have the position, and, uh, and now we're going to talk about the uh, velocity. Of course, we like the velocity also to be a four vector. And was, the position we said is a four vector, okay? But if we take the derivative with ordinary coordinate time, t, it's not, it would not be a four vector because t is not scalar. It's part of the a vector. It's not a scalar. So if you distribute it to t, you would end up something is not a four vector. So, but we can construct a velocity four vector instead of different respect to coordinate time with different respect to proper time, because proper time is invariant scalar. So that will not change the transformation property. So, uh, the x mu t tau, uh, you have these components, uh, different respect to tau. And this should be a four vector. Now, if we would de denote the different respect to proper time, tau by a dot, then the four velocity may be you know, was this this expression written as x dot mu. Uh, this should be a four vector. So each component, the dt, x, y, z are with a dot, means different respect to tau for each of the term. Okay, and I said the four velocity should be a proper uh, vector, so therefore transforms, uh, in fact, as a contravariant component of vector, so it transforms like a, a polarized transformation. Now, well, okay, uh, we can bring it back to the order distribution of time, but remember the coordinate time t is. Uh, related to the proper time, which is tying the rest frame by the time dilation formula. Okay, t equal gamma times tau. So therefore, dt tau, the difference between the proper time, is the same as ordinary derivative of time, but you have to multiply a gamma factor. So therefore, the, the, the full velocity, which we've been talking about, is, is gamma times the uh, the difference respect to order and time. It was, remember we said that this is not a full vector, but multiplied by gamma, it become a full, full vector. Okay. So if each component differs respect to time, and of course dt dt is just one, and the dx dt dy dt simply this is the order of order velocity. Uh, 
So therefore, the four velocity is simply is a four component. The zero component is c, and the one to three components order and velocity. All this has multiplied by a gamma factor, which of course is one one over square root of one minus v square over c square. Sometimes we put a subscript uh, v there in, in a gamma just to remind us how we're talking about. Because later on we could talk about gammas with different velocities. So it's nice to keep track which gamma we're talking about. Now, if there's a four vector, then if you contract with, with the contra covariant components, we should get an invariant. So if I uh, remember if I make it into a covariant, I have to pick up minus sign with C. So therefore, when you square that, you gamma square minus C square plus V square, V is order of velocity square. So if you if pull the minus C square out, it's just the uh, 1 minus V square over C square, which is just 1 over gamma square. So gamma square times just become 1. So the, the product is minus C square, which is manifestly uh, it's a constant, it's an invariant quantity. Uh, so therefore, this four velocity do have the property of the four vector. Now we can show from the Lorentz transformation of this four velocity, we can derive the uh, velocity, ordinary three velocity additional, which we have mentioned before. So we say the four velocities should be transformed like a proper contravariant components, and which means I explain right out the, the Lorentz transformation. And again, I put a, a V here into, this is the relative V is the relative velocity of the two frames of the uh, O frame, the O prime frame. Okay. And the beta and gamma the usual. Uh, combinations. Now if we call the x t u, the x prime the t prime, u prime. Okay. So therefore uh, the full velocity is remember there's a gamma factor. Now if this this is u, if I call this uh, uh, dx dt is order of velocity we'll call that u, uh, then this gamma is a gamma for the u uh, velocity. So this, uh, to say this full velocity transform this way, the, so originally this x dot is, is this quantity, gamma u, c u, and the, the, the prime one should be just one same thing as prime, and here's Lorentz transformation. Okay. So this is how the full velocity transform, and we're going to use that to derive the ordinary velocity addition rule. So we just do the matrix multiplication for the uh, first factor uh, uh, gamma prime u uh, c equal to uh, the first first uh, first first uh, column multiple uh, first row multiple first column. So we'll have uh, c minus beta u. Okay, beta is v c. So if I take out uh, take out the C from the left hand side to divide on the right hand side. So I have these two gamma factors and this C factor just cancelled by the division and this have C square here. Okay, so so this gamma factor relation. Okay. Gamma U prime equal to gamma gamma V gamma U times this one minus U V C square. Now for the second row I have uh, Gamma prime u u prime equal to the uh, second row and the the column. So again, I have gamma u, gamma v, and gamma u. I have uh, uh, minus beta c. Beta is v over c, so c cancel, so just minus v <coughs> and times u. So from the four velocity transmission rule, I get these two relations. Now, if I substitute this uh, gamma prime here into this second uh, relation, and uh, then both sides will have uh, gamma v, gamma u cancel, 
and so the u prime is simply equal to uh, <coughs> u minus v from this side and divide by uh, well, that's exactly the 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 new velocity issue we have derived before in the first chapter. So it's, it's, this really checks the consistency of our uh, using this four velocity we have just introduced. So once you know the four velocity, then we can find the four momentum. Okay. And uh, so if we have the four velocity this way, so naturally we could define four momentum by multiplied by a uh, mass, which again was a scalar mass. Okay. Uh, m times, so this still, if this is a four vector multiplied by scalar, this should be a, a four vector, okay? And the scalar is, uh, the, the the four velocity remains just gamma for the series component C and the one to two component which is ordinary vector, ordinary velocity. And this supposed to form a four, four vector and the four vector has zero component, P not is the zero component. And then the one, two, three component called P1, P2, P3. These are the relativistic momentum. So compare these two equations. We say we find the the relativistic three momentum, uh, three the one, two, three, is is simply equal to gamma times mv. So gamma times mv, of course, the usual uh, momentum. But now, if you go to a non relative limit, you know, which goes to small velocity limit, of course, the gamma factor becomes one. So this goes to mv. That's just a familiar non relative uh, momentum, velocity times, times mass. So, okay, so we know the one to two component of this should be identified with uh, uh, relative momentum. Now, what about the zero component, this p naught? What is that? Okay, again, looking at this relation, this P naught should be gamma MC. Okay. Or if we factor the MC, uh, write out the gamma factor, so MC 1 over 1 minus V squared over C squared, square root. Okay. Now, what is this quantity? Let's f find physical significance by taking the, again, the then relative limit, because small. So we're going to make a binomial expansion uh, for this uh, factor. Okay, so we take the non relative limit. So this factor become one, it's basically just multiply this one out. So minus might become plus, and this one half factor, so v squared, c squared, plus high order terms. Now, if you take out this, uh, uh, you multiply mc squared inside, so you have one over c outside, so you have mc squared plus one half. The important thing is that when this goes in, <coughs> times the c squared cancel, so we have one half mv squared. This we recognize is just a familiar kinetic energy term, just energy. So if this is energy, so very naturally, we will consider the p naught directly related to relativistic energy. Okay. And of course, what's new is that we find the energy has a constant term, uh, mc squared. So, uh, so anyway, you go to the, uh, Velocity equals zero limit. I still have an energy term. Okay, even this term all vanishes. I still have the MC term. That's of course new. That's the discovery of uh, equal to MC square. So therefore, relative energy it should be so it should be identified with C times the P naught term, and it should be M gamma MC square. So the uh, gamma is factor there because for moving particles, so I we'll have uh, nine, nine zero, nine, nine equal to one, so, uh, but if you go to low velocity limit, it's gamma equal to one, that's the usual, so that'd be the rest energy term. Now some people prefer even at this point, still writing this equal, equal to mc squared. Uh, uh, they identify so-called dynamical mass uh, the m star is the uh, gamma m, and so so it depends on the velocity. So it's a velocity dependent term. Okay. So now this m is no longer scalar because you 
multiply this uh, uh, this gamma factor there. So, but we will never use this uh, uh, this m star dynamic mass. When we talk about mass, we always talk about the rest mass, this m here, because that scalar which have proper transformation properties. So, uh, so we're going to get, get confused. So we only use the the scalar mass. Anyway, so the four momentum has the zero components. The energy over C is, is the zero component, and the P one two three is the relativistic momentum. And for mass particles, you have gamma m c square for E and the gamma m v for P. You notice because the gamma factor blows this blows up when when it, you approach the larger, larger V approaches C, okay? So therefore, it takes infinite energy for a particle to reach C. So there's no particle can travel faster than C. Okay. This is sort of obvious, you immediately see that. But, <coughs> but the ratio of the relative energy and the, and the momentum, okay, PC over E, is both has gamma factors, so the gamma factor cancel, so V over C. So this relation holds independent of gamma factor. Okay. That's a very important relation. So momentum over E simply equal to V over C. So we do an exercise for the break. Uh, we will talk about this break supposed to give us some idea about uh, relative energy momentum conservation. Uh, consider a particle sc scattering reaction. Two particles A, B come together and comes out the final particle C, D. We want to show that the conservation of relative momentum, which we talked about, a gamma M U, uh, U is the velocity of the, you know, whatever, the particle, holds in every inertia frame if it also has uh, energy conservation in the form of gamma mc squared. Okay. So in order to have momentum conservation, we must have energy conservation at the same time. So uh, more precisely what I want to show is that if we assume uh, for simplicity, let's not talk about three, but just, just one dimension, just, just uh, one dimension velocity. So the uh, addition to the conservation of momentum in the O prime frame, which will be for A, gamma, let me, gamma sub A, which because this gamma sub A is one over M U, uh, U A square over C square, okay, square root. So uh, gamma M U for A particle plus gamma M U for the B particle, that's the initial momentum, must equal to gamma, m u for the c particle plus gamma m u for the d particle. So the initial momentum equal the final momentum. So we have momentum conservation. So for this value in the O prime frame, not only we must have the validity in the O un prime frame, but also we must have the energy conservation in the un prime frame, which is the uh, gamma m c square. Uh, for A, gamma M, C for B, the sum must equal to the C and D term. And for to for you to prove this statement that this condition requires these two, uh, you must you you should use the the gamma relation which is obtained in the previous slides. Again, uh, I suggest you pause and hold this page and. Uh, uh, to do your problem.